from a few teeth to no teeth, the doctor-patient conversation. I want to start by thanking our sponsors, Colteen, Oral Arts Dental Laboratories, and Romero Dental Seminars for making this case review series possible. We also want to remind all our followers that we are uh, getting very close to our next hands-on experience in the city of Atlanta, Georgia. This hands-on experience will be held on Friday, April 26, 2024, and Saturday, April 27, 2024. We will be talking about the imperceptible aesthetic restoration, and we will devote three hours to lecture and six hours to hands-on participation. We only have a few spots left for our Friday, April 26 course, so please, if you want to join us, make sure that you visit our webpage, www.romerodentalseminars.com. We also want to remind everybody that we have a very, very active YouTube channel, Romero Dental Seminars, and please make sure that you subscribe to our channel and click on the bell so that you can get immediate um, reminders when we upload our most recent webinars. You can also visit all our previous webinars and case series. There's a hundred, a hundred plus videos already in our YouTube channel. Please make sure that you also share this YouTube channel with colleagues and friends. So our objective today is just going to be one, how to have this conversation. I think that we can all agree that it's definitely not an easy conversation to have with our patients when we are looking at their x-rays or their CBCTs when we are doing our clinical exam and we notice that the majority of the teeth, if not all, need to be extracted. And even if only a few of these teeth need to be extracted, maybe it will become kind of challenging to restore this case by trying to save some of the teeth. So we really have to uh, be very objective at the time of, uh, of treatment planning and diagnosis, but most importantly, how do we communicate this very well or how do we have this conversation with our patients, and that is what our presentation today is gonna to be all about. So step number one, explain the why. So in order for me to be able to share with you how I go about explaining the why to my patients, you know, the first thing that I wanna say is that this is when dental photography becomes extremely important in the way that we communicate with our patients. One thing for us is to just sit down and talk and show them some x-rays, Many of our patients, if not the majority of them, don't even know how to interpret x-rays, don't understand a lot of the things that they're seeing on the x-ray. But a completely different story is when we go ahead and share their own dental photography, you know, their own intraoral photographies with them, or we share, just for explanation purposes, other similar cases to them and why we chose plan A versus plan B as a clinical option. So for this particular case, I want to share with you, and I, want, and I want to walk you through the process of this case and how I go about sharing with the patient, you know, my decision making um, and why my recommendation would be towards one treatment plan versus another. I think that, as you know, if you grab three dentists and you sit them in a room and you show them all the same photos, and then you separate them and you tell them to, you know, to try to uh, come up with a treatment plan, we can all agree that we're gonna, we're gonna have three very distinct treatment plans coming out of each room or each clinician. And this has a lot to do with our way of thinking, our training, our philosophy of care. And these are things that are very, um, very, um, uh, I can say, very related to specifically to each and every dentist. In, 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 in my perspective or in, in the way that I see dentistry, I tend to be very conservative, but there's, you know, there's so much things that you can, there's so many things that you can do to try to save teeth. And then you have to put into, into perspective the financial aspect of trying to save those teeth. Is it in the best interest of our patient? Once you look at the financial aspect, then you say longevity. Is this restoration or, or is this option that I'm providing for my patient, is it going to be there for the next 10 to 15 years? Because if it's not, maybe from a financial standpoint, it wouldn't make any sense for our patients. So here you can see I'm sharing uh, the, 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 the FMX of the patient. And as you can see, and if you look at the FMX, you can see at the amount of issues that this patient is actually presenting in the few teeth that are remaining in the maxillary arch. And also 
some complications or some, you know, uh, extensive care that we would need to provide in order for us to try to save some of the teeth in the mandibular arch. And, and, and previous, you know, before I go ahead and sit down with the patient and, and try to discuss with them my treatment plan and my treatment options, I always have the first question in that initial interview that is critical, which is, okay, you know, um, financially, how ready are you for this, for me to provide care for you? Can you give me a ballpark of what do you think that you would like to spend in a treatment plan for you? And what are you looking out for the outcome? Are you looking for a perfect smile, every tooth where it needs to be? Are you willing to compromise and having some clasp here and there and maybe have a removable partial denture on both arches? Is that something that you would agree with? Would you rather have something, a complete denture where I can fix every single one of your dental problems and make a very nice and aesthetic denture, but still compromise with the removable aspect of it? Or are you willing to go with something more fixed, like a hybrid, you know, understanding not only the expense of something like that financially, but also the amount of surgical procedures, the extensive surgery sometimes needed when you need to remove, you know, a, a, a good quantity of bone in order for you to create ideal interocclusal space or prosthetic space between both arches in order for you to be able to restore a patient under those conditions. So again, there's a lot of questions, a lot of conversation that have to initiate, I would say, in that initial patient interview in order for you to develop something that is in the realm of, 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 of the financial aspect of the patient and its true interest. Don't just come up with one option. Don't think that every single patient that you have in your practice is a candidate for a high or is a candidate for an overdenture or for a removable partial denture. You really try to, you have to try to categorize them and obviously try to come up with a treatment plan that will make financial and biological sense to the patient. And again, if you look at this case, you can see the upper teeth. And I'm going to go ahead and just in the next slide, I'm going to tell you which teeth cannot be, in my mind at least, could not be restored, would not be ideal for me to, you know, to tell the patient, let's go back and restore these, these teeth. You can see that uh, starting from the right side, there's a, you know, there's only one a second premolar left. And if you look at that second premolar, you can see, you know, the lamina dura, the thickening of the lamina dura and the mobility that's already in this tooth while we were doing the clinical evaluation, maybe a mobility type two. We have a fractured canine with that is you know probably not a restorable tooth. We have a lateral incisor with a large buildup and a crown that has a a silver point as a, a, a bit that was used in order for them to accomplish uh, endodontic treatment. We already know how how bad these these type of restorations or these type of endodontic treatments fail. So that's going to be a problem. We have a tooth number eight that seems to be, you know, doing fairly okay. A couple of composites here and there. But look at the crown on tooth number nine with a distal open margin. And again, we would have to remove that crown. Uh, the, the tooth also has a root canal and has a small pearl in the periapical of the tooth. So again, when you start looking at those maxillary teeth, you start seeing, okay, in reality, how many of these teeth can I really say predictably? Let's go to the, the mandibular arch. You have a, a, a furcation involvement on the first molar on the lower right side. Uh, then you have uh, some fractured teeth and bone loss on some uh, mandibular incisors. Um, and then on the other side, you have a three unit bridge with an open margin on that distal abutment tooth with some secondary decay. And the tooth has already been restored or patched, if you want to call it that way, with an amalgam restoration due to a caries on the buccal surface, as you can see on the x-rays. And again, you know, these teeth, multiple restorations, uh, you know, what would be in this patient's best interest. And when I look at them, when I map out the things, when I start writing down, and this is all I'm doing in my office, and I'm looking at the x-rays, and I'm looking at the CBCT, and I'm looking at the photos, I can start writing down, and literally what you're seeing on the left-hand side, that photo is me with one of my patients going through the process of what teeth can be saved and what teeth I would not recommend saving. And I'm very graphic when I do this, because again, during this conversation, is where I want really my patient to pay attention, to understand what the process is, and to understand why we're choosing one option or we're recommending one option versus another option. And again, as you can see here, mobility on the premolar, silver cone on the end on the lateral incisor, and open margin on one of the central incisors, a short endo cast and a cast post on the other premolar on the opposite side, and a short endo on the molar. So things that we would have to correct. 
We would have to redo some of the end, or we would have to redo all the ceramics. We still have, you know, large edential spaces. Are we planning to place an Im some implants there? Would the patient be happy with the complete denture? What are the finances of the patient look like? And again, if we go to the lower arch, we noted a pearl on that first molar with a fracture of the crown that you can see it on the photo, and we have a furcation involvement. So now we know that there's a tooth that doesn't have a really good prognosis. So my question would be, why would I include this tooth in particular into my treatment plan? And again, you have a fractured and a fractured tooth with a with a with an endodontically treated tooth on that lateral incisor. He's missing one of the central incisors. He's got mobility on the other central incisor, mandibular central incisor. So again, we're looking at there right now at least three teeth that would need to be removed. And then we have that open margin on that three unit bridge on the lower left side of the patient with a secondary cavity and an already uh, an old amalgam that has been placed on the buckle of the same tooth just to patch a, 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 cav a, a caries lesion that he had a couple of years back. So now we're looking at, okay, am I going to save that second molar in order for me to redo a three-unit bridge? Would it be wise for me just to remove that tooth and put the patient in less expense? Would it be ideal for me to, to give this patient a, a removable partial denture? And, and again, one of the questions that I ask myself, and this I do on the, on, on the, you know, me, myself, and I in my office when I'm reviewing the case, I ask myself, if this patient has gotten to the point that he's lost so many teeth and we still are having secondary decay, we're still having some of his, his, older, den his older dentistry failing, how much would this patient really uh, improve in, in regards to home care and in-office care if we decide to save some of these teeth and we would decide to place some implants here and there or maybe an RPD, you know, supported by some implants here and there. Again, the more complex our dental procedures, the more care the patient has to have. And this is one of the reasons why we decide if we think that financially makes more sense to me and biologically removing some of the teeth, this is when I decide, okay, i rather remove. And this is how I go explaining to the patient. You can see right now that those red X's that you see on the screen are the teeth that I'm recommending for the patient not to try to save because these teeth are compromised biologically. They're, com they're dentally compromised and they need to be extracted ideally in order for me to create a better environment in this patient's mouth. Now, by removing that maxillary lateral incisor, am I going to place a clasp on the central incisor if the patient doesn't have any money for implants? And if he does have money for some implants, how much money does he have? How many implants can he afford? And where would these implants be better used? Now let's look at the lower arch. He's losing the first molar. He's, looking, he's losing both mandibular incisors. And he's got one bridge because now I'm going to put in yellow. These, these X's in yellow are my question marks. How predictable would it be for me to restore these teeth again back to what the patient had? Meaning going through the root canal, post and core, or core buildups, and new crowns. And again, how much expense would that be for the patient? And how much can I let this, how much, how long can I keep these restorations in the patient's mouth, knowing the dental history of the patient? And again, that's why it surprises me tremendously when I see patients with really bad, broken down teeth all the way to the gum line. And then I see dentists go ahead and removing all these teeth, removing five to seven millimeters of bone, placing four or six implants and giving these patients a hybrid from day one to day two. In my mind, the question that I always have is, do we really think that these implants are going to be better than the patient's natural teeth that he previously had? If he was not able to take care of those teeth, why would he change from one day to another to now suddenly really take good care of his implants? So these are questions that we have to ask ourselves. Every single one of us is going to have a different answer for that. I'm not here to try to change the way that you think. I'm just here to try to convey with you or share with you the way that I think and the way that I move throughout reviewing all my patients' cases. So my step two is going to be for the patient. Once I let them know, this is the reason why I would recommend removing these teeth. And I am recommending for this previous patient extracting all the teeth. And financially, he can only afford two implants. So I'm going to give him a denture and an overdenture and a maxillary arch. I need to now explain to this patient how this is going to be done and what the outcome is going to look like. And again, these for me are critical topics that we need to sit down and convey to our patients so that when they come into the treatment, they understand everything we're going to be doing. And one more time, dental photography is so useful for this. This is a different case, different patient. And again, financially also, a patient that was not uh, able 
financially to add any implants to her treatment plan. So when I view patients and they tell me, you know what, doc, I just can't afford going that route at this moment. I'd rather just use, you know, just go in a more simpler route. Well, if I can save some teeth in the mandibular arch, if they are stable enough to me to save them periodontally, and 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 obviously uh, from a carry from a um, from a carry standpoint, if I can save those teeth, then I can use them to try to give this patient a, a, a removable partial denture on the mandibular arch, which I know is going to help stabilize. Uh, that denture give it support, retention, and, and, and stability within that mandibular arch, which is so difficult for us sometimes to deliver a really good, uh, uh, um, complete denture. On the upper arch, it's a little bit different. Some of the teeth were, you know, many of the teeth were broken down. Uh, again, patient didn't have financially, couldn't afford, you know, root canals and crowns or savory crowns. So we all have to put this into perspective. That's, again, why that initial conversation with the patient is so important. So again, if we review the panoramic x-ray of this patient, you can see that in the mandibular arch, some of those canines and premolars were teeth that I could really use. At this point, they were stable, no mobility. They did have some recession, a little bit of bone loss, but no mobility. You know, we were motivating the patient to keep these teeth nice and clean. We motivated her also to come every four months to the practice, you know, to complete hygiene, to make sure that we kept everything nice and clean because she did have recession. She did have some of some root surface exposed. And also, as, as, as we all know, you may, you're going to probably accumulate a little more of, you know, biofilm, plaque, sometimes even calculus around those areas, mainly because of the, you know, the class and the, and the actual framework for the RPD. So we just, again, have to educate our patients, motivate them so that they can take care. This is what ended up happening in the upper arch. Again, we just removed all the teeth in the maxillary arch. We gave this patient a complete denture on the maxillary arch. And what we did on the lower arch was just to design an RPD similar to the one that she previously had so that we were not changing, you know, a lot. She was already used to the class and used to that design of the framework. So we kind of replicated what she initially had. But you can see at this point, we've taken our final impression for the maxillary denture. And we've taken also a, a final impression. We had our framework already fabricated for a mandibular denture. Uh, we're going to do a split cast technique. And you can see there is a cast on the right-hand side for the split cast technique. We have a process base for the maxillary denture. We'll get our vertical dimension. You know, you know all those steps. But this is just the way that I sit down and I explain to my patients, this is what the extractions are going to look like. This is what the process and the steps are going to look like from the day that we extract your teeth to the day that we give you final dentures. And with the day that we deliver the denture, we like making these short videos. And these videos are so powerful. These videos are so powerful because you can see that this patient is having a really hard time to remove that maxillary denture. And when our new patients or patients that are going to go into these treatments see these videos, they say, wow, is that the amount of suction that you can accomplish with the denture? And my answer to them is yes. I can do it for any patient on the maxillary arch. And most likely today, there are very nice and good techniques to try to accomplish the same thing on the mandibular arch. Not saying that it's easy, but it's something that we can do. Now for this particular patient, because we were able to save some of her mandibular teeth, we just gave her, uh, we gave her a removable partial denture that we had designed for her, and that was good enough for her, and it gave her the nice stability, uh, support, and retention that she needed for that mandibular uh, prosthesis against this excellently performed maxillary denture that was so retentive that she felt completely comfortable with. And finally, in my step three, I'm going to explain the sequence. I'm going to tell the patient, this is, this is, we already spoke to them on why we need to remove the teeth. We already told them exactly how we're going to do this and what the outcome may look like. And finally, we're going to walk through them through the sequence. And I show them this so that they can get an idea of how are they going to go from having some teeth to having no teeth. Now, every case is different and you know this better than I do. Every single case is going to be different, but I'm going to share with you one case and how I went about sequencing the case just for logic for, for me to try to maintain some of the information that the patient brought to me the day of her first appointment. On the left-hand side, you're seeing the preoperative uh, uh, MI photo, retracted view photo. You can see that all the teeth are in contact. This is the actual vertical dimension that the patient presented with uh, to my practice during her first visit. So knowing that I had a good vertical dimension that she was used to, I was not going to change that. 
I liked it. I thought it was enough space for me to give her an upper maxillary denture and a lower mandibular over denture. So I, I wanted to keep that vertical dimension. And the way that I decided to keep it, to keep that, um, that information, was that I decided to extract first the maxillary posterior teeth and the mandibular posterior teeth. You can see on the right-hand side, I've removed already the maxillary teeth. In this slide, now I've removed the mandibular teeth. And I'm going to share with you now the new photo the before and after. So you can see on the left-hand side how she presented, on the right-hand side after extracting all the posterior teeth, but keeping the vertical dimension through the anterior maxillary and mandibular teeth. So what do I do next? I grab some, uh, some putty uh, PVS and I just mix it by hand. I put it in the patient's mouth. I have the patient closed down and I allow this to fully set at the vertical dimension that I want to establish and to copy within the patient's mouth. Once I do that, I scan that vertical, I scan that PVS with the maxillary arch, the mandibular arch, and a bite. And then I go ahead and submit these files to my lab for them to print two immediate dentures. The day that I receive the immediate dentures, I go ahead and extract all the maxillary teeth, remaining maxillary teeth. I extract all the remaining mandibular teeth, and I place all four of my implants during the same appointment and I delivered the upper and the lower immediate dentures, and that's what you're seeing there. So now my patient knows, oh, okay, so right after the surgical procedure where you extract all my teeth, I'm gonna go home with teeth, and the answer to that is yes. These are not gonna be your final dentures. We are gonna make a beautiful denture at the end, but this is gonna be nice enough, aesthetic enough, enough and comfortable enough in order for you to go home and continue with your life until we wait for everything to heal three to four months, and this is the final delivery of the denture. You can see that very nice suction that we were able to accomplish in the maxillary arch. And at the same time, you can see how nice that click on the implants for that mandibular over denture. And we have the patient tap, tap, very nice and stable maxillary complete denture and mandibular over denture. So with this, I want to thank everyone for being part of this case review. I hope this information is valuable for you. And please, if you have any questions, don't you know? Just make sure that you write them in, in in the chat box below, uh, in the comments chat box below, so that we and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. You may also send us any questions you may have to our Instagram account Romero Dental Seminars or through our Facebook account Romero Dental Seminars. Thank you and have a great rest of your weekend.